Galatians chapter 6, starting at verse 1. We went through this verse 1 last week, but I just want to join it together with verses 2, 3, 4, and 5 and look at it in context. He says here, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. And so there's two implied truths here in verse 1. One is, number one, you, members of the body of Christ, and I, you and I are responsible for keeping the church pure and keeping it free from sin. And when I say that, we all are sinners. We all sin and have problems with our flesh. We all battle the flesh on a daily, hourly basis. That's not going to go away until we get to go to heaven and get free from this body. But the type of sin that we're talking about is what the uh, Apostle John calls a sin unto death. It's a sin of rebellion. It's a sin of deliberation. I, I, uh, I will do this. I insist upon doing this, and I have no intention of changing. In fact, I really don't even feel bad about it anymore. That's the type of sin we're talking about. We're not talking about Christians who occasionally get caught up in their flesh and fail God and then feel horrible and repent afterwards. We're not talking about you, okay? We're talking about people who uh, come in and insist upon continuing in their sin. We've got to keep that sin out, okay? That cannot stay. And so the first implication we're talking about here is the fact that you, Christian, you are responsible to keep the church pure from sin, that kind of presumptuous sin. And then secondly, the, uh, the uh, implication here is the fact that if someone starts to go astray, you're going to know about it, which means there's intimacy, there's relationship. We don't just come into church and take a number and sit down and barely speak to anybody going in or out. It's, our lives are interwoven. And if someone starts to go astray, we notice it. And we think, wow, what, something's wrong with you. What's, what's going on in your life? Something doesn't seem quite right. And that takes relationship. That takes knowing one another. He says here, if someone starts to go astray in that way, if they're caught in a trespass, and remember last week we said that word caught is saying that they, they have uh, been overtaken by a sin and they can't get out of the trap themselves. They need help. It doesn't mean that you have to go and accost someone every time they do something that looks a little bit wrong. That's not what he's saying here. This is talking about someone who's been overtaken in sin and they need help getting free from the trap. Restore such a one in a spirit of what? Gentleness. And that context of gentleness is going to be the theme here from verses 1 down through 5. You'll see it. Restore them in a spirit of gentleness, meekness, mildness, a mild disposition. Don't be harsh. Don't be self-righteous. Don't chew them out for the fun of it. Don't belittle them in any way. Remember, we, we talked a lot about in last week about the fact that God never gets into shaming people. He never gets into embarrassing people. He's not that kind of a God. He deals with you in gentleness, doesn't he? In that spirit of gentleness, be approachable. You know, if, if we started to really do this and started to bring correction to one another in that spirit of gentleness, we wouldn't have to chase people down. They would be coming asking for help because they would know I'm safe here. I'm going to be dealt with gently. They're not going to take my head off. They're not going to belittle me. Remember, we talked a lot of, last week about how, you know, love covers a multitude of sins. And so I feel safe. I can come and confess my sins because I know they're not going to broadcast it on Facebook. You know, it's going to be kept confidential. They're going to help me privately. And so all of those things make up that spirit of gentleness to where a person feels safe in coming and receiving help. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. How are you tempted? Well, you could be tempted um, 
by observing them in their sin and maybe, uh, oh, thank you, honey. And you, you start watching them in their sin and you think, well, I'd, I'd kind of like to do that. You know, if it's okay for them, maybe it's okay for me. And so you can be tempted in that way. But then verses 2 through 4 go deeper into this temptation. Verse 2, as you're doing this, as we're watching each other and loving and caring for each other and restoring each other in that spirit of gentleness, he says in verse 2, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? What was the standard and the precedence that Jesus set forth? He died on the cross bearing your sin. And so, by the same token, we put up, we bear patiently with one another's faults and sins. You know, as, especially when you're a small church like this, and we get to know people, we get to know each other's faults, don't we? And uh, we see cracks in each other's armor. We see fault lines in each other's character. And we know someone's weaknesses. Someone may be prone to anger. Someone may be prone to emotion. Someone may be prone to certain uh, sinful habits or sinful enticements of the world. And we, you get to know that about one another. And that can be a real breeding ground, a, a real uh, cesspool of some criticism and judgmentalism and a whole bunch of stuff. Bad stuff that destroys our unity. So how do we put up with one another? You know, when we see faults and sins in one another's lives, how do we deal with that? We bear up under one another's burdens, fulfill the law of Christ. Just as he bears with your sins, we are to bear with the sins and the faults of one another. Love does what? Love covers the multitude of sins. And so when he's saying here in verse 2, we need to be careful not to become impatient, critical, or judgmental. Do we speak the truth? Always speak the truth, but you speak the truth how? In love, with that gentleness. And so we, we spent a long time last week talking about, you know, when you approach someone, how can I make this as easy as possible for them to hear? If they're going to be offended, you want the truth to offend them. You don't want the delivery to offend them. If the delivery offends them, then you did something wrong. If they're going to be offended, let it be the truth that offends them. So, you know, just like Paul had Timothy circumcised when they were going to go minister in a Jewish region, we've got to be thinking, okay, how can I make this as easy on them to hear as possible? Bear up under one another's burdens. Never go to someone, you know, because you're fed up or frustrated or irritated or impatient or angry. That's not bearing one another's burdens. That's not fulfilling the law of Christ. Verse 3, for if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. This aspect of bearing one another's problems and burdens and sins is how you can gauge spiritual maturity, is what he's saying. How, how spiritual are you? How spiritually mature are you? You're willing to put up with a lot. You're willing to bear with a lot. How are you with your spouse? How are you with your children? Uh, do you have to correct your children? Absolutely. But what's the spirit in which you correct them with? Are you patient with them? Are you gentle with them? Now again, you know, I made the point last week of saying that uh, raising small children is a little bit of a caveat. It's a little bit of an exception to what we're talking about. With small children, we understand from Galatians, they're under the law. Uh, they're being told what to do. You, you deal with them a little bit differently than you do mature brothers and sisters in the Lord. But if you can't handle seeing the faults of your brothers and sisters, then you are spiritually immature. If you start thinking that you're better than them, if you start criticizing them or talking behind their back about what they did or said that was so wrong, you're spiritually immature. Just face it. If you think you're something, when you can't even bear with the faults and sins of your brother, you're deceiving yourself. And then secondly, 
don't become proud or self-righteous by comparing yourself to their faults and sins, you know? Well, geez, I don't do that. I would never dream of doing it. How can they be so sinful? Well, you've got your own baggage. <laughs> Just think about the sins you wrestle with, you know? It, it's like the liar looking at the thief saying, I'm so glad I don't steal. Boy, who, that's terrible. How can they do that? Well, you're lying, right? And you have the proud person who's self-righteous and they're, you know, they're talking about the person who gossips. What's the difference? We all have our battles, don't we? We all have our bondages. We all have our baggage that we're carrying. So don't assume that you're better than someone else just because you don't do what they do. You've got your own stink. Verse 4. But each one must examine his own work. And then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. So what he's saying here is when you're examining your spiritual life and the growth that God is working in you, don't rejoice in how you compare to that other person. Well, I think I'm better than them. I think I love God more than them. I don't do the things that they, I don't watch anywhere near the TV that they do. He's saying, don't, don't boast in regard to another person. Don't compare yourself to the other person. What do you rejoice in? What do you take joy in? You take joy in seeing what God has done in your life. God has set me free from this, and I don't fly off the handle with temper anymore. And you know what? I, I, my TV viewing has cut way down, and I don't watch those bad movies anymore. And look at what God has cleansed me from and delivered me from, and... What he's saying here is examine your own work and be happy in what God is doing in your life. Don't compare yourself to the sins and faults of others. Verse 5, for each one will bear his own what? His own load. And when he says here, will bear his own load, in context, I don't want to go through the whole explanation, but in the, the Greek meaning, plus how this word is used in the New Testament. I think it's used about five or six times in the New Testament. I gave you one example there for my yoke is easy and my burden. It's the same word, is light. What he's talking about there is the burden of your conscience, the burden of your sins, you know. Every day we fight with the battles in our flesh. And every day we remember and grieve over the sins of the past. And every day we face consequences of bad decisions we've made in our life. And that's the load that he's talking about. He's saying, look, everyone's bearing this load of sin. Everyone's bearing this load of consequences. So don't look at someone else and say, boy, I'm glad I'm not like that. You've got your own stink. You've got your own mess that you're bearing around. Each one is bearing their load. So just because your stink looks a little bit different than their stink, it still stink, okay? So don't think you're better than they are. Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 1, he says, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. And when you read a passage like this that is a little bit confusing, it's really good that we have four Gospels that we can start to do some comparison. And look over at Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Luke records it this way. Do not judge, and you will not be judged, and do not what? Condemn, and you will not be condemned. Because the Bible, uh, all throughout, Old Testament, New Testament, it's very clear. We are to discriminate between good and evil, aren't we? We are to judge one another. We are to judge fruit. But we are not the judge, and we can't pronounce condemnation on someone. And so he's saying, do not judge and you will not be judged. Don't, don't have that spirit of condemnation, that spirit of bitter criticism, that spirit of assuming that you know what the outcome of their life will be and what their judgment will be. That's none of your concern. That's in God's hands. He clarifies it even more in verse 2 of Matthew 7, where he says, for in the way you judge, you will be what? Judged. And so the clarification in verse 2 is this. Yes, we are to judge and discriminate between good and evil. So it's not that we don't judge, 
what Jesus is focusing on is the way we judge. Do you judge with mercy? Do you judge with sympathy? Or do you judge with harshness? Do you judge with self-righteousness, with criticism? For in the way you judge, that's how you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? And this is really what Jesus is saying here is so true. You know, you've got a speck, and the speck is smaller than a log by quite a bit, right? But it's the people with the logs that do all the criticizing. It's the people who've got the bigger problems that do all the criticizing. And uh, so that's one aspect that he's speaking to here. But he's saying, don't you notice the log that is in your own eye? And then look at what he says here. He says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will what? See clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And so he's talking, it, it, this is all a matter of perception and judgment. What is your perception? Basically, what he's saying is this. Don't discriminate the good and evil in your brother's life without being fully aware of and cognizant of your own sins. Because when you're aware of your own sins, and when you feel the pang of your own guilt, and you feel the, the pain of the consequences of past decisions that you've made. When you go to someone remembering all of that, very aware of your own sinfulness, you're going to be merciful. You're going to show pity. There's going to be compassion in your heart. But if you go to someone and you're not mindful of your own sinfulness, that's when you're going to be harsh and condemning and critical. And so what he's saying here, this all is a matter of, are you seeing clearly? Are you going to address the sin in that person's life with your own sin in full view? Are you aware of your own need and your own sinfulness? Hey, James, I think your room is down the hallway. Yeah, I think so. Okay. At least he makes himself at home. That's great. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Look at these two quotes from John Calvin and A.W. Tozer. So important. John Calvin. Our true and genuine wisdom can be summed up as the knowledge of God and the knowledge of who? There's got to be self-awareness. And you know, so many of the writers write of this. Men of faith, men, our forefathers in the faith. You've got to know yourself. And I'm not talking about knowing yourself in the conceited, self-centered, selfish way. I'm talking about knowing your problems, knowing what's wrong with you. And you have to recognize it. You have to deal with it by the grace of God. And you have to move on. But nothing is worse than someone that doesn't see their own faults. No one is as conceited and no one is as cruel to others as the one who can't see his own sinfulness. A.W. Tozer, the most godly Christian, is the one who knows himself best because he knows what to fear. He knows what he needs to guard against. And when he goes to someone else, he goes in that spirit of humility you go with the attitude of, I don't have any right even bringing this up because I know what a mess I am. But let me tell you what's on my heart. And when you go in that type of an attitude, you're going to go gently. The, the gentleness is going to just kind of ooze from you naturally because, again, you see your own failings. Luke chapter 18, verse 9, and he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And these type of people, look what they always do. They view others with contempt. 
Nobody else does it quite right. Nobody else does it as good as they do it. Nobody else is as good as they are. Nobody else is as dedicated as they are. And they view others with contempt, which means to make of no account. You know, one of the greatest things that you can give your spouse, your children, your friends, your brothers and sisters is respect. Respecting who they are, respecting who they are in the sight of God, respecting the fact that Jesus paid his body and blood for them, respecting the fact that God wants to use them as as a vessel of the Lord, seeing the good in them, seeing what they have to contribute. He says two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The tax collector, man, if you were called a publican, if you were a publican, uh, you were one of the most hated creatures. I mean, you were right there with a Sumerian dog. They were bad on the lowest rung of the ladder. Why? Because these were Jews who worked for Rome collecting taxes. Why did Rome send a Jew to collect taxes? Because they figured other Jews wouldn't attack a Jew. But these guys still ended up being hated because they could collect whatever amount of money they wanted to. They had to pay Rome a certain amount of the collection, but then they could charge over and above for their own personal income. Now, you know what happened, right? Some people tried to get rich off of this scheme. This is pretty good. I can charge whatever I want. Whatever they could collect, they could keep over and above what was due to Rome. And so they were viewed as deceitful, as con men. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. It's funny how the people with the logs... The people with the logs can think they see so much. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, and this is to be our attitude, standing some distance away. You know, when you've really failed and you've really sinned and you don't feel like you can even approach the throne of God in prayer, that feeling is not all that altogether that bad. You need to realize this sin separates me from God. You need to realize this sin that I commit, committed grieves and offends the holiness of God. Now, you can't get off on that too far because you have to understand the grace and forgiveness of God and He wants you to come. But standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven. He was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. The sinner, not a sinner. I, I am the sinner. So conscious, so aware of his neediness. I tell you that this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who is, exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. So which one was justified? the one that had the proper attitude of his own sinfulness and neediness. And so this whole passage here in Galatians, this is the whole train of thought, thought through this whole thing. Don't boast yourself against someone else. Don't compare yourself to the sins of others and justify your own self-righteousness. He says, don't you know you're bearing your own load of sinfulness? And so how, how can you go and be harsh or judgmental with your brother when you're aware of your own sin? Be gentle when you go to restore. We must restore because we've got to keep sin out of the church, especially sin that is presumptuous sin, especially sin that has overtaken someone and they can't get free. We need to help them. We need to cleanse the church in this way, but we do it gently. Father, we thank you for your word to us this evening. and Lord, we come humbly before you. Father, we ask that as we're around each other and we, 
we notice things about each other that don't seem quite right or might be a frailty or it might be a fault or it might even be a sin. Father, instead of being critical, we pray that our heart would go to the person in sympathy, in compassion, because we know what it's like. Oh, we may not be dealing with that particular sin, but we've got our own set of warfare. And so we're sympathetic. And if something needs to be said, we're going to say it in gentleness. We're going to say it so that it's the easiest for them to hear it as possible. If they're going to be hurt, it's going to be the truth that hurts them. It's not going to be the delivery. I'm going to seek to express it to them in the best way that I can. And I'm going to bear patiently with their faults because I love them and because I'm in the same boat they are and I know what it's like to battle the flesh. So I'm going to be gentle. Father, we thank you for... We thank you for the example of Jesus who so lovingly washed the disciples' feet. He didn't belittle them. He didn't uh, demean them. He didn't embarrass them because of the stink or the dirt or the sweat or the grime. Just as a servant, he just very gently washed off the dirt. Teach us the, the love that he operated in as we wash each other gently with the Word of God, the truth. Father, as we go and finish out this week, I pray that you would be with each one of us. Father, I pray that you would strengthen us, protect us. Father, I ask for your blessing, for your anointing to be upon every home, every heart here. Father, fill us with your glory. Fill us with your presence. Let us walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep us from the evil one. And bring us back Sunday to worship you again. We pray for strength for Denise and for Rosie and the family tomorrow. Bring them a comfort that only you can bring. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.